sorry, I forgot to hit that button. <laughs> now we're ready to go because you all definitely want the recording of this um, and the replay for after today. So you can look back and make sure you caught everything that Joe has to share. So again, thank you for joining us this afternoon. With that, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Joe. He has been with Transamerica for Hmm, I don't remember now, but he's been in the industry for 11 years or so. I can't remember, Joe, what you said for how long you've been with Transamerica, but he's currently living in Florida, and um, they had a chilly day today at 55 degrees, so I thought that was uh, quite the little tidbit he had to share, considering those of us up here in Minnesota got a, a rude awakening at 20-some degrees this morning when we all got up, so very chilly, um, so we feel really sorry for Joe and his family down there in Florida <laughs> suffering through 55 degrees today. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Joe. If you guys have questions throughout today, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A box. Um, Joe will probably get a, give you a lot of the answers today throughout his presentation, um, but if there are any of those questions that don't get answered, the team here at Sign Financial Group will make sure we follow up with you or touch base with Joe to get you those answers that you need. With that, take it away, Joe. Thank you very much. I appreciate that introduction. And thank you, everybody, for dialing in today. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit about Medicare. And since we are in open enrollment right now, um, I'm hoping that the information we share today is going to help you, especially if you were a, a first time enrollee or if you're one of those folks who may have enrolled last year, but you need to change your coverage and you're wondering, hey, how do I do that? When do I do that? And what are some of the costs associated with that? Um, that said, your best source of information on Medicare is almost always going to be Medicare.gov. It's a great resource for you. Um, I tend to find that uh, Medicare.gov, Social Security.gov, those websites, uh, or SSA.gov actually, but uh, but those websites are, are really user-friendly because I do think that they have taken into account that uh, it's the, the primary audience is retirees, stuff like that. So they do make it uh, very user-friendly. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get started today. So um, since we're specifically talking about Medicare, let's what is Medicare? Well, it's a federal health insurance program that's that primarily assists those who are age 65 or older. So certainly some people under 65 can qualify for Medicare, and that's based on whether you have a special situation or a disability. A few things to keep in mind about qualifying for Medicare is that you must wait until age 65 unless you're uh, one of those exceptions I, I just mentioned, um, even if you're already collecting Social Security. So, uh, and also you don't have to be collecting Social Security to enroll in Medicare. You're eligible for Medicare at age 65, whether you're collecting or not. Your spouse's age doesn't count. This isn't, uh, there's not family coverage. So everyone must qualify by being age 65. Again, unless you meet those exceptions. A few important things to remember, and we'll go into additional details as these with, on these as we proceed today, uh, is that Medicare doesn't cover everything and missing enrollment deadlines can result in costly permanent penalties. Uh, lastly, the options for coverage do vary uh, greatly. So we want to ensure uh, that we're not overpaying for services we may not need, or, or conversely, that if we're not skimping on coverage that could save us uh, from coming out of pocket and eating into our retirement savings, right? So at the end of the day, though, the coverage options uh, you're, you choose should provide you a sense of comfort and knowing that you're, uh, you're covered uh, should anything arise. So what we're going to talk about today, I'm going to give high-level overview of Medicare. We're going to go into some healthcare costs. Those are pretty eye-opening. How to select the best coverage. Again, that's going to depend on your unique situation. And then we'll go through some of the enrollment periods. And like I mentioned at the top, we are currently in the open enrollment period, which lasts through early December. So let's start with a high-level overview of what Medicare is and what it does and does not cover. So before we get started, let's talk about some key terms I'm going to mention throughout the presentation today. The first being deductible, and that's the amount that must be paid out of your pocket before an insurer is going to pay any expenses. Your copay or coinsurance is your share of the cost on an individual medical bill. And finally, the premium is what you pay monthly. So that's the amount the insurance company charges for that coverage. So uh, when it comes to enrollment, it's important to know that uh, it's not just for people who retire after many years, as I mentioned at the top, it can 
um, be for anybody who is disabled or has a end stage renal disease or any of those uh, special circumstances. But generally speaking, it's going to be for those who are age 65 and older. And when a person asks us, uh, can my spouse who doesn't qualify for Medicare on their own earnings record be on my Medicare plan? What clients are typically asking is, can my spouse still get Medicare? And yes, they can. Uh, they must be 65, married for 12 months or longer, and one spouse must have paid Medicare taxes for at least 10 years. Each spouse will be covered individually, however, because there's no such thing as quote unquote family coverage like you would have with employer sponsored insurance. This also means what that means is that each spouse must enroll on their own. Um, in the event uh, you have dependent children or grandchildren that don't qualify for Medicare, you may need to purchase additional insurance to cover those unexpected medical expenses should they arise for those dependent children, uh, dependent adult children, or dependent grandchildren should your children have uh, predeceased you. So when people talk about Medicare, they're often referring to either original Medicare or Medicare Advantage. And there's several options when it comes to Medicare. So we're going to talk about each. First is original Medicare. Um, and, and whether or not that's the right decision is going to be up to you. But uh, what Medicare, original Medicare is parts A and B. So when it comes to parts A and B, that is run by the government. And they have ancillary benefits like prescription drug coverage and Medigap that can be added on. Uh, those are supplemental and Part D, the Medicare, the Part, Dr Part D drug plan and Medigap plans are private insurance, whereas Original Medicare Parts A and B are the government. Part C is called Medicare Advantage or Part C. They're kind of used interchangeably. Again, run by private insurance companies, and you can attach Part D, a prescription drug plan, to a Part C plan as well. So if we're looking at the top line of our slide from left to right, we're talking government is that blue um, circle, then private insurance companies cover just about every other circle on our screen here. And so Medicare uh, Advantage or Part C, maybe the option that will make you feel the most comfortable if you want something that resembles, uh, if you were a long time employed and you had employer sponsored healthcare coverage, Medicare Part C, and we'll see in the future, in this presentation that it kind of mirrors what you're used to from an employer sponsored plan. So when you choose Medicare coverage, you have those two main options and that's the federal government or the private insurer. So what does part A and B cover? Well, part A covers hospitals, skilled nursing stays and hospice care, where part B covers your physician visits, outpatient services and home health visits. And if you think about those two things, part A and B, that kind of covers really the basics that you would ever need. That said, it doesn't cover uh, your prescription drugs. So if you have a prescription drugs and you're going into Medicare, you're gonna wanna think about that. And you're going to most likely wanna pursue an optional Part D plan to get uh, that private Medicare improved um, drug plan. Uh, additionally, you can also add on a Medigap plan. And what this does is it's a private insurance plan that helps with out-of-pocket expenses, deductibles, and co-pays. So you're coming out of your pocket <clears throat> just a little less when you're visiting Medicare-approved doctors. Finally, Part C, that's the 100% private, is these include Part A and B, and sometimes they'll include Part D. So one, if you uh, select a Medicare Advantage plan, seeing what it has um, in its wrapper, it might have that Part D prescription drug plan. And these are all Medicare approved insurance companies. Um, items that are generally not covered by Medicare, uh, vision, dental, and hearing may be covered by an Advantage plan. So you're not going to get vision, dental, and hearing under original Medicare at all. You would have to get additional insurance for those things if you have uh, vision, dental, or hearing issues or checking that Part C that has those coverages. So talking about Part A a little more in depth, we'll talk about our premiums. And again, this covers your hospitals, your medically necessary skilled nursing, some long-term facility stays, and hospice care. Generally speaking, if you paid taxes in, you're not going to pay uh, a Part A premium. 
But uh, if you do have to pay, the, the payment can be as much as $506 per month. But again, most people will not pay for Part A premiums under Medicare. So when we're talking about what's covered on that Part A, we do have some of those hospital or uh, skilled nursing stays. So when we're thinking about that, what are the costs associated? Well, if you're on an in-person or inpatient hospital stay, days one through 60, zero dollars. It's completely covered. Days 61 through 90, you're going to pay $400 per day under uh, original Medicare. And days 91 plus, it's going to be $800 per day. And then finally, um, if you exceed that, you're going to be going, uh, it's going to be all costs. And there is a, uh, a lifetime reserve day that uh, we will get into in a little bit. Skilled nursing and long-term care, days one through 20, zero dollars. Days 21 uh, through 100, 200 dollars. And then over 101 days, you're going to be paying all costs out of pocket under original Medicare. And uh, you do have a $1,600 deductible for each benefit period. Medicare Part B, this is where your uh, most people's expenses come in, um, in terms of premium costs. Uh, as I said, Part A is generally covered. This does do, uh, this does cover doctor visits and durable medical equipment. Um, <clears throat> what's not covered is that uh, once the annual deductible has been met, you typically owe 20% of the Medicare approved costs. Your annual deductible in 2023, $226. And there is a standard monthly premium of 164.90. We'll see that on the next slide. And that does increase and can go all the way up to $560.50 for high income earners. Um, <clears throat> though most folks will uh, pay less on average. And here is uh, kind of the chart. So it is a progressive scale in terms of how much uh, you make. So the minimum you're looking at there is that around, I'm just going to use round numbers, is around $165 a month. And recall that if it is you and a spouse, that's going to be multiplied times two. So effectively, you're looking at a, a little over $330 or right around $330 for um, a couple collecting or using Medicare as their insurance. And it can obviously go up as your uh, modified adjusted gross income goes up. <clears throat> so how are those premiums determined? Well, the Social Security Administration determines um, if you owe an IRMA uh, based on your income and you will, and they'll mail you a notice and it's called an initial determination. This notice will also include information on how to request what's called a new initial determination. And, and that's if you've uh, experienced a life-changing event that would have caused an income decrease before or in between when uh, the Social Security Administration created this document and when they sent it to you. So, so some of those life-changing events are listed here. So you have a marriage, a divorce, work stoppage, work reduction, loss of income, or an employer settlement pay payment. So mo many things can impact um, what your income looks like because what they're doing is your premium is going to be based on um, what your income was two years ago. So if you're looking at what your premium is going to be today, they're going to be based on your income in 2020. If you don't qualify to request initial uh, determination, uh, but you still disagree with Social Security's IRMA decision, you have the right to an appeal. Appealing an IRMA decision is also uh, referred to as requesting a reconsideration, uh, keeping that term in mind, reconsideration. So keep in mind that uh, there's no strict timeframes in which Social Security must respond to a reconsideration request, and you must continue to pay Part B premiums uh, until they decide your appeal. So if they change their decision, though, uh, you will be refunded for the difference uh, on any incorrect amounts paid. So uh, if you continue to be dissatisfied with uh, Social Security's reconsideration determination, you can request a further review, and uh, that would be before an administrative law judge. And if you're dissatisfied still, uh, you could proceed to level four of the Medicare appeals process and on to level five if you remain dissatisfied. So there is a lengthy appeals process should you um, disagree with Irma. That said, by the time most people uh, get to level four or five, they're into their next uh, their next two year cycle anyway, just because of uh, timeframes. 
So when we are planning um, for what our retirement is going to look like, we should keep that IRMA in mind and consider strategies that may help us uh, reduce or eliminate those surcharges. Because going just $1 into the next tier means paying that larger surcharge uh, on those Part B premiums for an entire year. So viewing IRMA in the context of our financial picture holistically as it relates to uh, various income planning and tax strategies from making qualified charitable distributions and strategic distribution planning, meaning distributions from Roth accounts and HSAs, uh, to the timing of when we realize capital gains and losses and taking our social security benefits, all of these can play a role in mitigating those IRMA surcharges. So thinking about trying to minimize our taxable income to ensure we're paying the smallest premium possible. Because as we saw, just for a, a couple on the bare bones, um, insurance is going to cost you around $330 a month, which is not, it's not a small number, especially if you are on a fixed income. And again, it goes up to $560 per person. So if you decide to stick with original Medicare, or depending on the Medi uh, Medicare Advantage plan you do choose, you can add Medicare Part D coverage. And that is going to uh, potentially help you lower your prescription drug costs. At least that's the that's the hope, right? So if you only have one medicine that's a very low cost um, generic prescription, you may not need a D, uh, Part D plan. But if you have multiple, you're probably going to want to look into this and see um, how much it's going to reduce your costs. These are, again, private insurers that are approved by Medicare. And each plan can vary in, the, in its cost and the drugs covered. You are responsible for the premium, the yearly deductible, co-payment and co-insurance, and those costs will vary um, depending on which drugs you're taking, the type of plan, um, if your pharmacy is in the network, uh, and if the drugs are on that plan's list of covered drugs, and you can see what drugs are covered by each Part D plan by going to medicare.gov. Uh, obviously, before you decide on any plan, you're going to want to make sure that it does cover any prescriptions you're currently taking. And again, medicare.gov is going to be your best resource for that. So this uh, screen here, this is a great screen. So if you are uh, listening to the recording or you're on today, um, there's a lot of information on here, but these are the deductibles and co-insurance requirements for part D uh, uh, in 2023. So your initial deductible, um, the beneficiary pays 100% you'll pay up to $505 where the plan pays zero. Um, and then $505 uh, is the amount spent on deductible before that uh, initial coverage period begins. So uh, again, a lot of information here. So what I would suggest, um, and uh, your advisor can probably take a screenshot of this or send this to you, but this is a great uh, slide for planning. And there's just a lot of information. So we can't really go into the entire thing, but knowing that, uh, that, that there are costs associated with your prescription drug plan. Speaking of costs associated with that prescription drug plan, here are our Part D premiums, and the, this is what pays for those prescription drugs in retirement. This is also based on that IRMA um, amount that, that we mentioned earlier, just like Part B premiums. This is going to be uh, based on your modified adjusted gross income, so it is reported on the federal income tax return from two years prior, plus any tax exempt interest income. So the higher your MAGI or modified uh, adjusted gross income, the more your Part D premium can go up. So we saw earlier our Part B looking at about 330 for a couple. Well, here, if you're at that uh, low end of the income spectrum, you're adding for a couple another $63. So now we're at almost $400 a month and just kind of our basic medical care, basic uh, drug plan for, um, so in retirement. So you're looking at about $400 a month, which again, not an insignificant number when you're in that uh, fixed uh, income <clears throat> stage of life. Uh, so if you want help with some of the healthcare costs not covered under original Medicare, you can choose to buy a Medicare supplement insurance policy the, these are more commonly known as Medigap. Uh, unlike Medicare Advantage, uh, those Part C private insurance plans, Medigap doesn't provide um, any actual coverage. It's just a supplement to Parts A and B. So in fact, you have to have Parts A and B or original Medicare 
before you can even purchase a Medigap plan. So as I mentioned earlier, it is sold by private companies, and these are designed to help cover costs that uh, parts A and B don't cover. Some policies may also offer uh, coverage for services that aren't covered by A and B, such as uh, medical coverage for when you travel outside the US. So if you plan on traveling abroad, Medigap is a great option. There are premiums associated with Medigap that do vary plan to plan. They also vary by state and region, and it can also vary by age. Uh, Medigap plans are um, no longer sold with prescription drug coverage, so you would need Part D as a um, separate, uh, separate option. Um, one note on the slide here that's very important is you can't use HSA funds to pay for Medigap premiums. That's a call we get quite often. Uh, when it comes to Medigap plans, and this slide is effectively a uh, carbon copy of what's out on um, Medicare.gov under their uh, compare tool. There's 10 standard Medigap plans, including one high deductible plan, and this is the current list. And all these plans are standardized by the federal government, um, meaning that if you are, um, if you get an A, uh, Medigap plan A, and you live in Florida, versus Medigap plan A and you live in California, it's going to be exactly the same. That said, the cost could differ. Um, the, the Medigap plan F is the um, most popular historically, although it is only available to applicants who were eligible for Medicare prior to 2020. So those of you on the line, if you were uh, el Medicare eligible prior to 2020, you can still get that great Medigap plan F because it is the most comprehensive supplement insurance plan available today. It covers almost all out-of-pocket costs that Medicare doesn't, including co-pays, co-insurance, and deductibles that are associated with parts A and B. Uh, again, the, the plans are all standardized, but they will differ um, in terms of like cost and stuff if your primary residence is Minnesota, Wisconsin, or Massachusetts. <clears throat> Medicare supplement plans, again, Medigap, uh, help individuals pay for things that original Medicare doesn't cover. That plan G, uh, which is now the most popular plan um, since F has kind of been sunsetted. So anybody who's new to Medicare, uh, part G is going to be uh, the one that most choose. And in most areas of the country, this starts around $90 per month. Um, but again, it can vary uh, depending on where you are located. The range can be wide though the, the, the coverage is exactly the same. So now again, going back to our uh, cost earlier, and we will see some cost breakdowns a little later. We are at 400 for a couple. Well, now we add another 180. So we're at 580 for a couple in retirement should they, um, should they also choose to leverage a Medigap plan, right? So again, not a small number. <clears throat> so whether or not Medicare Part A and B is the right decision, who knows? Uh, that is up to you and your unique situation. So what we're going to talk about now, since we've talked a little bit about um, Parts A and B or Original Medicare, are Part D. So if you choose an, a Medicare Advantage plan in lieu of Original Medicare, you're still going to pay that Part A and Part B premium. Again, Part A most people aren't going to have it because you have paid taxes in, but you will pay the Part B premiums directly to Medicare. Um, so Part A and B premiums still do. And then this Part C is going to have an additional premium on top of it, which we will see in a little bit. Um, you must meet those Part A and B deductibles. This does um, typically require you to work with a network of available doctors. Again, Part C, very similar to what you had uh, as your employer-sponsored medical plan if you had one while you were working, where you deal with in-network, out-of-network, that type of thing. Um, out-of-pocket costs being higher if you go out-of-network. Those types of uh, situations, is uh, it's very similar if you're leveraging a Part C or Medicare Advantage plan. Average monthly premium for this. $18 in 2023. And again, that is going to vary depending on the plan you choose, the amount of coverage you want, 
Um, so that $18 may not include hearing, dental, and vision. So if you want that, it may be a little more. So again, our roughly $500 uh, amount that we were talking about earlier, we're going to add, we would add that 18 per person should, it, should they choose um, Medicare Advantage. So we've talked kind of kind of went through the, the types of Medicare and Medicare at a high level, um, what parts A and B or original Medicare are, Medigap, Part D, and then finally Part C, which is the which are those private insurance plans. So let's talk about some healthcare costs. When I when, so I, every once in a while I'll present one of these uh, to to my wife just to kind of see if she has any questions um, because she's she's a client too. And uh, this slide here is the one that makes her eyes uh, about pop out of her head. And it's not that first statistic where um, it's the that health issues are the top or retirement related concern for adults over age 65. Um, it's that second number there, that $424,000. And that's the total lifetime health care cost of a healthy 65 year old couple retiring today. So you're talking about almost $425,000 for and I can't stress this enough, a healthy 65-year-old couple. So, and that's, this is including premiums and uh, this is kind of the average um, expected amount that a healthy retired uh, couple uh, today is going to pay throughout their retirement. So if you don't have $425,000 earmarked specifically for um, health costs, you're kind of behind the eight ball, at least according to, um, to Medicare. And then finally, this last number, 70% of uh, people turning age 65 are expected to use some sort of a long-term care during their lifetime, which is um, pretty fascinating if 70% uh, expect to use it. we um, Our statistics show that only about uh, 10 to 15% of people actually leverage a long-term care insurance policy or um, investments that have a long-term care rider associated with them. So what we're gonna do here now is talking about those costs is go through and say, okay, what do we need to account for? And I kind of did this as we were running through um, that original Medicare uh, section, but this is going to kind of lay it out for us in our total premium costs. And again, what we wanna think about is that these are individual numbers. So this is just for one person. Again, part A, as I mentioned previously, and uh, I, I hate to say it over and over, but most of you are not going to pay a part A premium, but if you do, it can range from 278 to 506. Part B premium, there's that minimum again. Part D, the minimum we discussed, and then the Medigap plan. So here, um, the total uh, without A, gonna be up $286.40 per person. Multiply that times two, if it's you and the spouse, and again, not an insignificant number. And if you do have to pay a part A premium, it goes up quite a bit from there. <clears throat> and again, that 286.40 number um, is individual, and it is also kind of the bare minimum in terms of uh, where you are on the, the modified adjusted gross income. So you want to keep that in mind, that uh, if your um, premium exceeds that 286.40, it's most likely because you're either choosing some additional coverage or you fall into one of those higher income tiers. Um, for those continuing to work, it makes sense to um, calculate those Medicare premiums versus your employer coverage. So looking at, okay, hey, how much does my employer insurance cost? How much does Medicare cost? If uh, your employer is paying 100% of your uh your employer sponsored plan, then you should absolutely stick with that if you are continuing to work. Um, some employers do subsidize coverage and, and make you pay at least a little bit. So again, checking to make sure that what you're paying for your employer's plan doesn't exceed um, your what, what you would pay for Medicare. That said, if you are continuing to work, a couple things to think about um, are one, once you start collecting Medicare, you can no longer contribute to HSAs, which we'll get into in a little bit. And also your employer plan, many employers are trying to reduce costs and offload uh, some procedures to Medicare. So checking with your employer plan and reviewing that with your advisor to ensure that you don't have to coordinate your employer benefits with those provided by Medicare if you're collecting. Because again, 
many employers are choosing to do that, enforcing employees to coordinate their benefits so that they can reduce their cost with whoever is providing that employer sponsored uh, insurance coverage. So kind of a review here, looking at our uh, parts A and B that, uh, and then looking at uh, what that equals up to, which was 442.90, 670. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna add our Medicare Advantage plan premiums on top of this, right? Because remember, as we said earlier, that when you do choose a Medicare Advantage plan, you are still paying your part A and B premiums uh, because you do still have to pay for original Medicare. So this is where we're starting at kind of a baseline um, 164.90 if you don't have to pay that Part A, which most don't. So Medicare Advantage uh, plans, there's Part C premiums. They are going to, um, have, you do have to pay that Part A and B. Sometimes your premium will cover Part D as well and some other um, ancillary benefits. It's dependent on the plan you choose. So the Part C monthly premium, does uh, vary based on the type and design. And right now, the average estimated monthly premium, $18 a month, but it can range from zero all the way to 200. And again, if you're looking at the zero, you're probably going to have higher deductibles, higher out of pocket. The $200 one, you're probably looking at a lot less out of pocket expenses and probably some more doctors that are included in that insurer's network. So now what we're looking at in terms of our, our cost structure here is our 164. And I, I, I try to not include the part A premium because most people don't, um, don't use it. So if you're looking at the, the part B, 164.90 plus an $18, uh, the average Medicare uh, Advantage plan, you'll get 182.90 per person. Again, that while that number looks, um, a lot better compared to the previous number we saw for our uh, original Medicare with Medigap and the Part D plan. Remember that plan that we just chose, our Medicare Part C, might not cover everything we want it to. And we might have some higher out-of-pocket expenses. So those are things we want to consider is, okay, hey, is that that cost? That sounds too good to be true, right? So maybe we want to check what stuff is coming out of our pocket? What does it cover? Um, and does it cover things that are going to relate to my personal health? If I've got certain issues that need to be taken care of, is that Medicare Advantage plan going to take care of me? Is it covering any kind of um, travel? Maybe, maybe not on the Medicare Advantage. And again, we did say that Medigap certain plans will cover some travel. Uh, Location-specific rules um, in terms of, again, the state you live in, the region you live in, can carry additional fees. And then finally, thinking about some of the convenience. So do I wanna stick with my doctor? Well, is my doctor that I was using prior to retirement, is, uh, is that doctor um, Medicare approved? If not, maybe I need to look, seek out that Part C or Medicare Advantage plan and then check to see if the doctor is in their network. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So here's kind of a side-by-side -side comparison. And again, I'm going to focus on those that say uh, down there at the bottom is a total cost without Part A premium, because again, most of you will not be paying that. We'll look at 269 versus 182.90. As I mentioned, that uh, that price may be too good to be true because it may not cover or meet some of your needs. Uh, Out-of-pocket concerns for original Medicare, there's no out-of-pocket max. Uh, premiums, co-pays, and co-insurance aren't included. But on the bright side, 97% of non-pediatric care physicians do accept uh, original Medicare. So that's good. As most doctors are covered. That said, if your doctor's not, try to see if they are in the network of a um, Medicare Advantage plan if you are committed to that physician. Uh, mentioned it prior, but you will likely need a, I don't know why it says may, you will need under original Medicare because it doesn't cover vision, hearing, and dental, you will need a standalone plan that has vision, hearing, and dental, and travel insurance. Under Advantage, or that Part C, maximum out-of-pocket, 
is a 7550. That was for 2021. We're waiting on the updated number for 2023. Uh, you do have premiums, copays, and insurance, and there are additional costs if you go out of the network for that particular plan. So as I've said a number of times, typically Medigap plans um, have the additional benefit of, uh, uh, of guaranteed status. So they, they did change the, the order on me. Uh, so Medigap, an important um, thing to note here, uh, I apologize, they, they, this, this presentation is hot off the press with some of the new 2023 numbers and, and they shifted something around on me. So the, during open enrollment, your first enrollment, you have a 60 day window uh, for Medigap. And if they don't cover it, I wanna come back to this. I wanna see if it's in here still, because um, we do need to talk about this. So, but, but um, if you do it in a certain window, they can't deny you Medigap insurance. Because remember, Medigap is a private, um, operated by a private insurer, and they do cover um, or help with certain out-of-pocket costs. So what some of the, some states do is they go above and beyond that rule, the, that federal law, which I'm hoping is discussed here. And if it's not, like I said, I will come back to it. Um, so... Connecticut, New York, and Washington, they have guaranteed issue year-round. Um, California and Oregon, you're permitted to change plans at equal or less of value annually for 30 days beginning on your birthday without underwriting. And that's the important thing on the federal rule is that there's uh, no underwriting rules um, within a certain period. Maine, you have a guaranteed right to change your policy um, to, to one of equal or lesser benefits if you have any gaps in coverage longer than 90 days in Missouri. We're going to change the plan annually on the anniversary. Um, and again, so, so these rules will apply to you. I know that most of you, or I believe most of you might be in Minnesota. Should you move, uh, that is an, a qualifying event to change your coverage. And then these rules, now that you're a resident of those states, will apply to you. So I know you're probably thinking, hey, I don't live in any states. Um, but if you do move, they will apply. So it's important to remember that. And Vantage plans do have uh, special needs policies and they do, they, they limit membership to people with certain diseases um, or characteristics. You must have parts A and B as with all Advantage plans. You must live in that plan service area. And you must have severe or those certain severe or disabling chronic conditions. So uh, these, these plans are tailored uh, to meet the personal and unique benefits of their policy holders are those special needs policies. So if you require one of those, if you do have a severe disabling chronic condition, seeing if there's an advantage plan that would work for you out there. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then finally, if you're a traveler, 97%, again, as we said earlier, they do accept 90% uh, of non-pediatric physicians do accept that original. Um, and you would need a Medigap policy to cover foreign um, travel emergency healthcare because overseas physicians are not covered by Medicare. Um, part C, that Advantage plan, many plans have that provider network. So if you are seeking uh, that a specific physician, uh, checking to see if they're covered, and then certain Advantage plans do cover foreign travel and emergency healthcare. That said, probably not the $18 plan that uh, we chose in the example earlier, probably gonna cost a little more to cover you outside of the country. Uh, another slide, um, similar to that Part D slide earlier, <clears throat> is this uh, that, that I feel is an important one to take a screenshot of or take a picture of, is this here just because it gives you a nice little matrix of comparing the different policies. So if you're under original Medicare, that you could see any doctor so long as they accept Medicare. And again, we recall 97% of uh, non-pediatric physicians do, whereas under your um, advanced plans in network, or you're going to pay a higher uh, cost for those out of network. So um, Part D prescription drug coverage is required for Parts A and B. Um, or if you choose an Advantage plan, you may not need a Part D policy if that plan covers some prescription drugs, especially those that you need to take. I mentioned it a couple times, Medicare doesn't cover everything. The big ones that, the, that are always mentioned are hearing, dental, and uh, vision, uh, but also long-term care uh, is not covered, foot care, cosmetic surgery, and 
most care in foreign countries, as I mentioned, you will need those plans that uh, cover you if you do intend to travel. They also don't cover co-pays, co-insurance, or deductible. So you will need to look for that additional coverage if you are seeking, um, again, this is just kind of reiterating, uh, the vision, dental, and hearing, because those tend to be the most important for folks as they age, because these are things that tend to decline as we get older, our hearing, our vision, and the state of our teeth. So without those separate standalone plans, these costs are going to be out of pocket. So um, you can use HSAs, uh, leverage your HSA to pay for these expenses, but it might make sense uh, depending on the status of your vision, hearing, or dental to, uh, to get a standalone plan to ensure that you're not spending too much. Uh, pivoting here to when we enroll. Well, uh, we talked at the beginning that we are during or in the middle of open enrollment period, and we'll get into that a little more in just a sec. But if you are uh, already retired, or if you're not even already retired, um, you have this window here around when you turn age 65. So you have um, three months before age 65, and then three months after age 65. It's during this initial enrollment period that if you're eligible for, uh, for Medicare, you must enroll or you'll have those costly permanent penalties. This applies to many people, but not everyone. And that's because if somebody's still working, you may be deemed to uh, have creditable coverage. That means you're covered by an employer plan that is uh, that has 20 or more employees. So you may be able to keep your employer's coverage. And like we said earlier, that may behoove you, especially if they are paying the entire amount for you. And it is, again, important to check that, uh, that your employer coverage doesn't require you to coordinate with Medicare. Oh, did it mention that? So uh, down here at the bottom, be sure to sign up for that Medigap policy within six months of the month you turn 65 to be a guaranteed issue. That's the point that I was making earlier where those other states have rules that go above and beyond this. Well, that Medigap policy, you sign up for that. So the month you turn 65, go out, get your Medigap policy because if you don't, they can deny you in the future. If you do it now, they won't be able to deny you. Um, and that's based on, so if you have a pre-existing condition or something that's going to require underwriting, they can't do that in the first six months after you turn 65. Um, once you pass that, they, they could deny you coverage and you could be paying a lot more out of pocket. So um, that's probably the biggest thing you need to think about when, uh, when it comes to enrolling in Medicare is that uh, Medigap policy within six months of turning age 65. <clears throat> Uh, there are uh, special enrollment periods. So if you do choose to work past age 65 uh, and you are keeping your employee or employer health care benefits, you might want to put off enrolling. So and if that's the case, you're going to have you're going to leverage the special enrollment period. So before we saw age 65, where you have to enroll. Well, this is if you continue to work. So if you're continuing to work, you have to enroll um, in Medicare within eight months of when your employer coverage ends. And failing to do that is going to result in those permanent penalties. Um, and then same thing, be sure to sign up for that Medigap policy within six months to have that guaranteed issue with no uh, underwriting. And then Medicare Part D, signing up within 63 days of losing that, uh, losing drug coverage if you had it through your employer. Don't ask me why. I guess the reason is um, it's the government and they don't make much much easy for us. But if you'll notice here on this slide, um, you have eight months to sign up for Part B. You have six months to find a Medigap policy. You have 63 days to find cut drug coverage. Why they're not the same? Again, government does not like to make it easy on us, do they? <laughs> so here's a nice little graph that just kind of reiterates what, what I just said, um, getting that uh, Part B within eight months of having that creditable coverage that uh, once you lose it from your employer, should be noted that COBRA is not considered creditable coverage. So it has to be like an employer um, type plan and 63 days to get your Part D drug coverage. So after you have Medicare coverage, we are in right now 
it's the annual and open enrollment window. And this is where you can make changes to the plans you have. So it's important to find out um, if, if any kind of unwriting or acceptance procedures are needed before canceling any previous coverage. So if you cancel like a Medigap insurance policy, yes, they, they may now, you're not going to get that guaranteed issue um, like you would if you got if you do it within six months of turning 65. The annual enrollment period runs each year from October 15th to December 7th. And anyone who's Medicare eligible, this is when you can join or make changes to your plan. It's when you can join a Part D plan, or you could switch from one drug plan to another, or drop drug coverage entirely. This is also when you could switch from original Medicare to Medicare Advantage, or vice versa or make changes to your Medicare Advantage plan. So let's say last year you said, hey, I'm gonna cover, you know, try to try to cover everything, right? Uh, any contingency. Well, turns out you spent way too much possibly and you're looking to reduce your costs. Well, this year, you, this is the period when you can dial back that coverage. Or conversely, let's say you underestimated what was going to happen this year and you had a lot of out-of-pocket expenses and had to uh, see different doctors. Well, let's look at what is going to cover, what, what plan is going to cover some of those costs um, so that you might be paying a little more in a premium, but maybe a little less out of pocket. Again, it's going to be uh, unique to your individual circumstances. And here's the slide that I was wondering. So uh, the, I, I said this is a new presentation. They kind of changed the order around a little bit, added the uh, 2023 numbers. But this slide probably should go back there before that uh, slide about the states that have the, uh, the, the the enhanced rules. But this is the the crux of Medicare uh, Medigap plans and enrolling at the six month period or within six months of turning sixty five. So during this th this time, but in that six month window, they can't use medical underwriting. So they have to guaranteed issue a Medigap plan to you. They, they can't refuse to sell you any Medigap plan that it offers. Uh, they can't charge you more for a Medigap policy than they charge for somebody with no health problems or make you wait for coverage to start. And again, except in certain circumstances, but you'll have to, for those, you have to go to medicare.gov. But that said, um, that pre-existing condition, if you have at least six months of continuous prior credible coverage before the Medigap effective date with no more than a 63-day lapse, the insurance company can't make you wait for coverage related to your pre-existing condition, nor can they deny you. So it's very important that if you're turning age 65 and you do have some pre-existing conditions and you, you anticipate a lot of out-of-pocket costs, get your Medigap uh, plan because that's going to help you with those co-pays, out-of-pocket expenses. Um, it is a little bit of, of a premium cost, but it's going to help you in the long run. And they can't deny you during this period. Okay, that's it's incredibly important here. Uh, pivoting now to HSAs, I mentioned them a little bit earlier. If you are continuing to work um, and you're collect, so this is where um, kind of a little social security uh, issue that tends to pop up for folks is so you're continuing to work, but you start collecting social security early or at full retirement age. Um, well, if you're collecting Social Security at age 65, you're automatically enrolled in Medicare. So what happens is if you're still working and you were contributing to an HSA, you can no longer do that. And the reason being is because Medicare is not considered a high deductible health plan, and you must be enrolled in a high deductible health plan to contribute to an HSA. So you would no longer be able to contribute to your HSA if you are enrolled in Medicare covered by another plan that's not a high deductible plan. You can be uh, claimed as a dependent, uh, are covered by TRICARE or TRICARE for Life, are covered by a VA or, or other benefits. What you can do is um, you can leverage a spouse's plan. So once you enroll in Medicare Part A or B, you can no longer contribute to that uh, HSA because you don't have that high deductible health plan. Um, being age 65 is irrelevant. Only that enrollment in Medicare disqualifies you from making contributions. <clears throat> that said, um, if you have a spouse who is HSA eligible, um, they're not enrolled in Medicare and have a high deductible health plan, uh, the Medicare recipient 
can actually contribute to that account up to the family maximum. So uh, essentially you would be, uh, you could use your own HSA to pay for you know, um, certain healthcare costs while contributing to your spouse's HSA. So how you would do that, and you should speak to your uh, tax advisor in, in terms of reconciling this come tax time, is that you contribute personal funds either through a post-tax payroll deduction, which you could set up uh, through your employer, or sending funds directly there, just personal funds, writing a check to the HSA. Then the, your spouse would deduct these contributions on their income tax return, either filing separately or married filing jointly. So even if you're collecting Medicare, you can contribute to your spouse's plan if they are still eligible. Again, consult with your tax advisor to ensure that you are reconciling that appropriately when it comes tax time. Uh, finally, we're gonna talk about long-term care insurance. If you recall, 70% of folks believe they're going to need long-term care insurance. So that's another cost you're gonna to need to account for in retirement is that potential expense um, of long-term care. Um, so we've talked about that there is some coverage for those skilled nursing uh, facilities, but once you get over that certain time frame, you're going to be paying quite a bit out of pocket. So private insurance, such as a long-term care policy, uh, would likely provide more comprehensive coverage. And in some circumstances, it can be expensive depending on your health. So getting it sooner rather than later when health issues arise is going to be um, preferable. Uh, so, and, so once you have health issues, there could potentially be uh, issues with underwriting and potentially an outright denial of coverage. So uh, when an LTC policy isn't practical or possible, you may be able to uh, leverage life insurance with an accelerated death benefit um, or using an annuity uh, that has um, a long-term care rider. Again, the, seeing if that rider um, is cost-effective is the absolute key. So if it's appropriate for you, that's when you could uh, leverage it. But uh, when uh, any uh, when all these options have been exhausted, you may be able to qualify for Medicaid coverage. That Medicaid tends to be or is typically for a more destitute. So it is based on what kind of assets and income you have. In that case, you're going to want to ensure that you're getting assets out of your ownership in your state, and you should consult with a tax advisor and an elder law attorney in your respective state because Medicaid does vary state to state. So you're going to want to check on that. So wrapping up our presentation today, I thank you again for um, dialing in this afternoon. Uh, there will be a replay. So if some of those slides uh, you wanted to go back and take a look at because they were kind of uh, inf information intensive, going back, take a look. Uh, hopefully they'll answer your questions, any questions you have. If you do have questions about Medicare, happy to answer them. That said, I can't get into your specific or unique situation. For that, I would suggest you do um, speak with your financial advisor. And if you do have to go a little bit deeper, our team would be here to help. So with that, thank you. And I will turn it back over to the folks at Stein Financial. Hi, thank you, Joe. That was Great. I don't know about the rest of you, but there was a lot of information in that and there was a lot to take in. So I'm very glad we have the recording to be able to reference back to. Um, and if you guys didn't get those screenshots, we'll make sure we grab some of those screenshots that Joe was mentioning throughout the presentation today and attach them to our replay uh, video email that'll come out here after the event to make sure you all can um, take advantage of those screenshots because those did have some really great information on them. Um, I guess I, I always just kind of wanted to end Joe with like, maybe what are you like, if you could give anybody any thoughts on like one or two things that everyone should do right now regarding Medicare or thinking about it, like what's like one of the biggest things that people should take away from our discussion today, do you think? So uh, the three, three, I think three things, right? One is um, leveraging your or trying to leverage your withdrawals and tax strategies, stuff like that to reduce your modified adjusted gross income. So you ensure that you're not paying those, those higher premiums. Um, second, I couldn't stress it enough about that uh, the uh, Medigap plans and mm -hmm. enrolling 
while you can before they can deny you coverage. And then third, if you are um, younger and you are still, you've got plenty of time before retirement, is that you know investing in your health today is investing in your wealth later because um, as we saw, almost four hundred twenty-five thousand dollars for a sixty-five-year-old couple today, and it's not in this presentation; it's in another one we do. But those costs, um, as of last year, so that's, this is before uh, we're dealing with the inflationary environment we're in presently. They're they're good. Those medical costs are expected to grow at five point eight percent annually. So if you are younger uh, and you don't have close to a million dollars, if I'm 40, right? 45. So I, I made myself a little younger, um, but I'm 45. So I've got 20 years. So in the expected cost for a couple in, in 20 years is well over a million dollars. So if I don't have well over a million dollars earmarked specifically for healthcare expenses, I should be taking care of my body as much as possible now, right? So if you're not in retirement yet and uh, you want to try to reduce those costs, it's taking care of yourself. So those, those would be my three things. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. That also explains, Joe, uh, your your hobby of spending time in your uh, gym in the garage in your <laughs> spare <right>. time. <laughs> you're, 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 you're living, uh, you're walking the walk, <laughs> walking try, the talk. Try. try. <laughs> Great. Well, um, I don't see any other questions popping in, but I'll just reiterate what Joe said. If anyone has any questions, please reach out to myself, Jeff, Anthony, anybody on the team here at Sign Financial Group, and we'll help get you to the right person to help you answer those questions, whether it's Joe and the Transamerica team or us or anyone that can help you out. Um, we're here for you guys. Um, and with that, I guess, thank you again, Joe, and have a great afternoon, everyone.